Good evening to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, tonight I would like to speak about a very specific methodology for sustainable architecture and urbanism. Uh, um, I will explain it, of course, later. Uh, but in general, what I see in the world is that uh, planning sustainable architecture or whatever, sustainable building, is that we use conventional planning methods and then apply like add-ons, whatever, photovoltaic cells or water recycling systems or lead and, what, and then everybody afterwards complains that the project becomes too expensive. Is that familiar to you? Yes. yes. Um, so this is another way of planning, a methodology of planning. Of course, methodology always linked to an object. And um, what I like to do tonight is uh, we'll t talk a little bit of, of our uh, uh, firm, what we are doing. Then we'll talk about the theoretical part of uh, uh, phenomenological sustainability. And then show you some projects we did in our firm to see how it is applied on a project. Right? And in the middle we have a little surprise. Okay, um, Open Space is a Brasilia-based consultancy firm. And Marcelo and Gustavo work here, are representative in Argentina and Uruguay. And we basically work on these uh, four fields. If you can see it, yeah, sorry. Uh, we work as consultants for projects that already have an architect or an urban planner or whatever, depending on the project. Uh, we do our own projects, I will show you some. Um, we do consultancy for big events, pop concerts or uh, the World Cup. Of course, by definition, these events are not sustainable, by definition, but at least we can reduce a little <coughs> bit of the, of the impact. And we do uh, scientific research in partnership with uh, Federal University of Brasilia on sustainability, of course. Why is it doesn't? This is a project that we are doing in the research field. Just a little bit about sustainability. In a very simple form, you can say that we need four elements to build. Water, energy, materials, and a social aspect, labor, the architect, in four phases. Yeah, the planning phase, the construction phase, the user's phase, and the recycling phase. Probably most of you think here. Energy efficiency in the user's phase. But do, do not calculate the embedded energy in the, in the project. Every know, everybody knows what embedded energy is? To produce this thing, um, yes. we have yeah. put energy in the process. We can calculate how much energy I have in my... Eh? So what very often happens, and I give you a exa simple example, uh, uh, a hybrid car, Toyota, Prius, what is called here, Prius, yeah? Everybody thinks it is sustainable because it consumes less gasoline and uh, emits less carbon. But what not, is not told in the marketing is that you have to drive at least for five years, 40,000 kilometers a year, to compensate the embedded energy in the second motor. So only if you drive more than 40,000 kilometers a year, then the car becomes sustainable, or less, less emits yeah. an improvement in, in comparison to a, a normal car. 
If you don't drive it, buy a normal car. Hmm? So mostly when we talk about sustainability, we look at the, the user's face. And very often there is an internal compensation which is not calculated. So what we're doing with the university is to try in the house where the whole circle, also the recycling, is neutral. What we call a climate neutral house. Calculating all the embedded energy also in the, in the meetings and in the materials that we use <coughs> and in the recycling system. And of course, the way I design the detail here has influence on how it can be recycled or not. This building is very difficult to recycle. But if you would plan it in a different way, then we can recycle it and reduce the impact. So this is a research project uh, that we do. Okay. In cellular biolo biology, these are the eight basic functions. If you, if a cell has these eight, eight basic functions, then life can come in. And of course, you can put them directly to a city or to a house. But you can apply them to a city or to a house, right? But do we feel protected in a city nowadays? Less and less, huh? I'm afraid. Huh? How you said it? Excretion? Garbage is a huge problem. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Movimento, transport in the city, well, here it's fine still, I guess. But if I go to Sao Paulo, forget it. <laughs> also, this is not only physical movement, the internet gets stuck, is not safe. Uh, so movement is much more than only the physical movement. Uh, so something, I guess, we're doing wrong. And in spite of green roofs, uh, economic lamp bulbs, uh, organic groceries, carbon trade, we know that the carbon emissions are roaring more than ever. So something we have to do. Um, but what happens is, I, I don't know, this is uh, an equation of Ehrlich and Haldren that says the impact that we have in the world is the equation of the number of people, the population, times the consumption they have, divided by a technological factor. The first two will be clear. This, the third one, we cannot deny that uh, we produce nowadays more efficiently than 100 years ago. Eh? The lamp bulb of today uses many less energy than 100 years ago. So, that reduces the impact. But now I have a question to you. One of you can mention a sustainable solution that is not based on the T. PV cells, here. Lamp bulb, here. Hybrid car, here. So what happens is that we, we bet on a technical, technical solution, which is a funny idea, because, because of the techniques, and the ongoing economics and that, we created the problem. And now we try to resolve it with the same thing that created the problem. Einstein already said, you cannot resolve a problem with the same level of consciousness that created the problem. And we still continue. And other philosophers, we'll see them, Nietzsche, uh, uh, Einstein, Siegler, uh, well, already Heidegger, warned for the consequences of technology. And I'm afraid they were right. So something else has to be done. How this all started? This is a project I did 
in, let me see, 89, 90, 91, something like that, in the, in the Netherlands still. The pro, uh, protected city, historic city in the middle of the Netherlands, and this is what we call the town hall, with all public services, passports, uh, social services, it's, it's all here. And the municipality wanted, uh, it was starting in the Netherlands 30 years ago, sustainability. We want a sustainable uh, building. So with the team, we brainstormed, etc., and we came up with a with a concept, this is the interior, come in, there's a central hall, daylight, well, all the basic things of sustainability. But I want to show you, yep, next one, is this here. It's in the middle of the, of the building. Down here is a water reservoir, 500,000 liters, rainwater treated, that is pumped up. And this glass column goes over four stories and the water goes, comes down on the outside of the glass column. And on the inside goes up air that we take in from the outside. And that's the way we cool the air or heat up the air, depending on the season. Uh, so the, 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 the water is also a way to regulate the humidity in, during the seasons. Um, mm -hmm. Next one. So this is system, here's the water reservoir, here this column, and then the air goes to the, to the offices, and the used air goes to the central hall, and with heat exchangers, the air goes outside, and this, the energy is put back into the system. Yeah. Um, here you see the interior, no ceiling, because you use the thermal mass of the concrete structure to cool down the building. It absorbs the heat during the daytime. In the nighttime, we inverse the process and then we cool down the building. The whole facade is of, of uh, wood frame, wooden structure, to reduce the carbon pr uh, footprint. Yeah, and the whole system is driven by PC cells that you saw in the first picture. Well, this is a historic city. Um, nice project, wonderful, everybody happy. Uh, energy bill zero for the whole building, so very happy. But I was thinking, this is an interesting process, we, we, we created the whole project and then had to implement it in this uh, in the in historic city. In the Netherlands, every citizen can stop the whole process by law. So to interfere in a historic city is a very, let's say, sensitive operation. <coughs> so a huge of meetings with whatever, uh, the, the citizens, the, the, how you said it in English, the, the cultural uh, heritage uh, commissions, etc., etc., to defend the project and then adapt it. Blah, 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 blah. Long process, took about three and a half years before we could start building. So why do I show this project? Because it made me th th thinking of why this sequence? Why don't we use the energy of the, all these meetings to create a building together? Because if you create it together, then everybody accepts it. Much easier. Of course, that will change my position as an architect. This is not my creation. I'm only a channel to, for these, these people. Huh? I translate what these people would like to do in material, but it's not my, my idea anymore. So I started thinking about that. On the other hand, in my private life, I did a lot of, let's say, uh, courses, retreats for personal growth, for psychological courses, uh, and these are some people I work with. I'm not going to mention them, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, phenomenology I work with. So doing this and then observing planning process, uh, on a certain moment there was a project that I joined them, the two, the two, and that changed the whole thing. Um, 
that was with him, Sebastian Elsesser, in uh, Croatia, Croatia, on an island where he bought a ruin of the 11th century, walls like this, this stone, everything stone without cement, wonderful, all carved. And he wanted to create there a center of creation where people could, painters could go, or writers to write a book or whatever. And what we did there, with all these exercises, we went there and the only thing we did, we meditated for one week on the place. Somebody has experience in meditating here? Or yoga or something like that? Huh? You know, you, you come in another level of communication with things. So at the end of the week, we sat down and said, this is what we're going to do. We didn't discuss it. We knew it. Why? Because we did not project, like in the first example, our idea on the place, but look to the place and just listen to the place, and then we knew what to, what to do. So we inverted the whole sequence. Yeah. So we started to see architecture in a different way. Not as a starting point for people to live in, but as an end, as, the, as written is here, as the materialization of the consciousness that was present in the process. And I, as a teacher, always joke with that. Yeah? If you put your drawing on the, on the wall, you're naked, psychologically speaking, because I see where you are by the project, by the, material, the way how you materialize things. And the question is, not the materialization, but the question is, what do we materialize? Dice, cuando terminamos de construir nuestra casa, de repente nos damos cuenta de que durante el proceso hemos aprendido algo que realmente necesitábamos saber del peor modo, antes de comenzarlo. Is it here or in Argentina that you have this, this nice saying, eh? the first ah, house... Argentina, Argentina. No sé si aplica un cuento que, que conocemos que es bastante común entre argentinos, seguramente aquí alguno lo ha escuchado, esto de que uno construye su casa, primero para, la primera casa que construye es para el enemigo, la segunda con suerte es para un amigo y solo la tercera es habitable para, para la propia familia. To, to avoid this. Eh? So the question is, how can we avoid that? Because I don't, I don't know what your opinion is and what, which conscious you know, but I see a lot of projects where we can apply this phrase, unfortunately. And most of the architecture nowadays are materialized financial models. Money is more important than the quality of the space, right? What happens normally is that a client comes to me already with some ideas. <clears throat> a photo of, of, of a magazine or whatever. A photo of a picture of a house that they saw on, on a holiday or whatever. This is what I like. Okay, that's nice. Uh, but I think it's next, next uh, exactly. We pay a lot of attention of what we think. But very little attention we pay on how we think. The structure of our thinking. This is David Bohm, he's a physician and, and uh, a friend of Einstein. He already had communication with Einstein and this is a nice book about the limits of quantum physics. You are, they already saw that that will, doesn't resolve anything <laughs> because of the way we think. And it's nice to read this. Huh? Yeah, la realidad es lo que tomamos por verdadero. Lo que tomamos por verdadero es lo que creemos. Lo que creemos está basado en nuestras percepciones. Lo que percibimos depende de lo que buscamos. Lo que buscamos depende de lo que pensamos. Luego, lo que pensamos depende de lo que hemos percibido. Lo que percibimos determina lo que creemos. Lo que creemos determina lo que tomamos por verdadero. 
y finalmente lo que tomamos por verdadero determina nuestra realidad. So that happens with the client. So where does that image come from that he, he or she or whatever it is likes? What is behind and what is the motivation behind this liking? And if we go into the structure of our thoughts, one thing we can, of course, we can talk for years about thinking, but one thing everybody will agree on, the moment we start thinking, we are not here. Because thinking is based on our past and our memory. It's very difficult to feel your own body and think at the moment, same moment. It's almost impossible. Buddhists know this better than anyone. Hmm? So people think that they like this image, but they're not aware that this image comes from their past. And then project it on the future, and then Nietzsche comes in. Because the house or the building is not exactly as they had hoped. Because we, we mostly uh, concentrate on the physical structure. What we like, if they come with the photo, is, is the wall or whatever it is, the floor. Or, uh, yeah? Sounds familiar? If you start a project, you start designing the physical structure. But we don't live within the walls. We live in between the walls, in the immaterial space. That's where we meet here, immaterial space. So we have to, to design the quality of our encounter, the human being. Now, of course, we need material for that, but that is a mean and not, a, not the objective. <coughs> Very often in, in planning process, the material is the objective. And the human aspect, forgotten. Hmm? So it starts with, what do we like to have to do here? Because the physical part, the physical envelope, of course, eh, satisfies our body. We have, don't have, we have heating, we have cooling, we have whatever we like. There's no wind, there's no rain. Perfect. But life is much more than our physical part. All our dreams, ideas, uh, rhythms, no, in here are written something, some of them. That makes part of our life, that may give sense to our life. Hmm? If I ask to everybody to tell me a dream, of course you have to dream that the big car, this big house, big house, but that's, uh, your real dream is, is different. Right? So, how to put in this essence of dwelling into the process. And as you may see, all sustainable solutions are also here. But here, fear is not here. If you, eh, if you have fear walking in the street at night, we're not, it is here. So how do we avoid, avoid that? And of course, you don't resolve that with electric wires and whatever kind of systems, because that's only a vicious circle, and more and more and more. Compounds, fenced compounds, etc. Yeah, this Brazil is full of them, and understood they start to come here as well, because the people are afraid. Because this is not included in the process. And uh, Heidegger says, you know Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, mm -hmm. philosopher? Huh? He will come back later. But he says, he inverts things. He thinks, uh, normally we think that we construct or build in order that we can dwell. To dwell, everybody understands dwelling? Dwell is la cualidad de habitar. But if we go to the essence, it is the, diff the other way around. We know, we have to know how to dwell in order that we are 
permitted to construct. And dwelling or, or habitar is, is not only a house, a professor is at home in the university, a truck driver is at home in his lorry. Eh? Constructing as inter human interference in this planet, right? This is not only a house. The director is at home in his company, right? So how he says we have to know to dwell ourselves before we can interfere. And it's a very important switch because from that one conclusion comes up, philosophical. If we knew how to dwell, the things we project, also architecture, would be sustainable by nature. Can you understand that? Because we dwell, we don't kill, we don't whatever. If we really dwell. Yeah? And the other question, of course, is, okay, knowing how to dwell, what is that? What qualities we should have for dwelling? Yeah. And there are a couple of architects, you will know them, uh, Norbert Schultz, uh, especially him, uh, Christopher Alexander, that tried to, to, to translate this view into, into architecture but that was long before sustainability came up as, as an issue. Everybody knows Christopher Alexander? Hmm? Pattern language and things like that. Hmm? But he said already that we have to create new patterns if new challenges come up. No, the sustainability of course is a question today. So this is where we work with uh, phenomenological sustainability what qualities we should have to dwell. <coughs> and then it's funny, when you go back in history, most of the philosophers already told it, said it to us. Everybody knows this picture, famous? Chartres, France. La Catedral de Chartres. The Labyrinth. He can tell much better than me what it is. In the cathedral, there is hay un, one of the most famous labyrinths of the whole world occidental, which is, at the same time, a kind of allegory of life and also of the way, because this is one of the great cathedrals of peregrinage. So, it is a way to recognize the peregrinos, to receive them, recognizing the great way they have done with this labyrinth. Pero también el laberinto es una forma, no sé si conocen, es, es, eh, hay, hay un gran trabajo hecho sobre laberintos como el mandala o la forma simbólica más universal en todo el planeta, en diferentes tiempos y lugares apartados sin aparente comunicación o probablemente no la hubo. Se ha dibujado laberintos como a la vez una alegoría de la vida, pero también como una honra a la tierra, como una primera forma de construir, en, en, pero en el plano. ¿Mm? construir un espacio que representa el camino de la vida y que representa los siete aspectos, porque Chartres es una elaboración posterior. El laberinto este que yo les menciono como común a diferentes culturas es el de siete senderos. Es un laberinto que no es para perderse, no es un laberinto como aquellos donde hay diferentes alternativas. Hay un solo circuito que tiene una sola entrada y se llega hasta el centro. La salida no es de allí atropellar el, el laberinto, sino el ofrecimiento después de alcanzar esa centralidad, ese, ese lugar, volver sobre los pasos, pero con lo aprendido en el camino. Este es, esta es la idea del laberinto. ¿no? Y uno vuelve en el mismo camino, pero con un aprendizaje que nos ha cambiado algo de la perspectiva, que eso cambia simplemente todo, porque ha cambiado la perspectiva. Okay. Uh, with this inversion of Heidegger, the way of thinking, hmm, uh, is one aspect, implicit aspect is that, um, and that's the labyrinth, that the wisdom is available. So we lost contact in our Western world. 
We were talking yesterday. We lost contact with it in the Western world. Uh, we were talking about yesterday about the Greek and the Roman temples. If you analyze them, where they have, have been built, on which energetic spots, uh, in Chinese, uh, Feng Shui does, does the same in another way. They knew exactly what they were doing. Now we build all over the place. Si ir a una acrópolis es entender, no con la cabeza, pero comprender físicamente que no podría haber sido construido en otro lugar. La pregunta es cómo es el proceso para alcanzar esa identificación del lugar, ¿no? y ahí es donde nos centramos. Of course, and with this inversion of the, pro of the, the process, instead of me being me, being me to create a, a, a project and implement it, is withhold myself and just see what would like to reveal itself. Reveal, everybody knows, revelar. Huh? Inside the client, the land, and inside me. And materialize that. Everybody who knows does yoga or another body related uh, exercises know that our body has wisdom. But we, we don't listen to it when we're planning, we just plan with our head. Of course, I'm generalizing, eh? but I think 99% of the processes are like that, right? But that has little to do with essence. So the question is to ask the right question to your client. But you can only ask the right question if you know yourself very well. So it's both ways. Yep. And then comes Kant with his trinity. Huh? The blue ones are his question. He has three basic questions in life. What can I know? What can I do? And what can I expect? Esperar is a little bit different, at least in Portuguese. It is more to expect. It's not esperar in terms of dreams, but what comes to me? Huh? So, and what we can see in our Western world, we are very here in the doing. People that do, that do, that are, earn a lot of money, that are successful people. Contemplation or reflect, yeah, you do it at home, in your free spare time, right? But don't do it when you are planning. <laughs> and that's this equilibrate the whole, the whole process. So, phenomenological uh, sustainability works especially here, because people know very, very well to do this in the Western world. This is less developed in planning processes. Yeah? <coughs> and when we reflect or contemplate, then the phenomenology com comes in. I don't know if you know this guy, Husler. He is considered the father of this philosophy. Huh? Um, it's just important, a little bit to say about it. Um, what do you see here? Hmm? A trash can. A trash can. Treasury. Nothing in it. What do you see now? <laughs> Treasury? No. And now? You see, we answer questions. You don't see a seat. That's a concept. You don't see a treasury. That's a concept. You see a cylindric, whatever, half transparent form. Children are very good in phenomenology because they don't, they don't have concepts. They know what a pencil is. Huh? They just go to it and to the essence of the thing. But we think in concepts. 
and with concepts, preconceived ideas. And that's how we plan. So, in phenomenology, it is not, the object is not a phenomenon. Not, nor, neither it's me, but it's the way how I create an idea or an image about this thing, or about you. Eh? So it's not the object. It is the way we perceive the object. And everybody knows if you need to meet a nice person uh, one night, what is a nice person? Would like to need to meet him again, or her. And when you meet, oh my God. Or the other way around, you fall in love, uh, whatever. But uh, it's changing. And the third time, it's uh, different again. And this fabulous lover, your wife or your girlfriend or whatever, can be the most fabulous person in the world. If you are angry, she should not come near. Because you are different, so you perceive her differently. Uh, a, a, a poor child. What, what's the coin here? Uh, please? Huh? No, the, the, the name of the coin. The, your... Peso. Peso, Peso, sorry, yeah. Um, a poor child perceives a coin of one, uh, one Peso as bigger than a rich child. Because you look at your history. But to go to the essence, you have to be aware, and that's what Socrates said, about the way you perceive things. So you have to be, you have a good perception about yourself, how you see things. And then you can go to the essence, and of course, if you have that, then you change the way you plan or project architecture. So there's an intention to go there. I can decide every moment where I put my attention. Yeah, or, or unconsciously, where I distract myself from my own essence. Hmm? Yep. So, to get there, what is important is, is the experience, not a rational model we create about things. Hmm? And he says it very well here. Encontrar el cobijo inicial en toda morada, aún en el castillo, esa es la primera tarea de un fenomenólogo. Es preciso superar el problema de la descripción para alcanzar las virtudes primarias sobre las disciplinas que describen los espacios, geografía, etnografía. Superar el problema de la descripción para alcanzar las virtudes primarias. Yeah, it's called geografía, but we can put architecture here in the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Heidegger has a famous uh, lecture in 51, eh, what he, what's called uh, to build uh, Bauen, Wohnen, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm mixing up all the language, Bauen, Wohnen, uh, Denken, uh, built to inhabit, to, to, to dwell and to think, where he shows these, these differences and uh, about the, talking about the perception of time, the perception of space, and how we can give meaning to our lives by constructing. But you can only do that if you know how to dwell. Yeah? I just saw the names, if you're interested, then the slides will be on the how you call it, the YouTube here, the internet. Yeah, it's going to so, be so, so you can read them later with call, yeah. because we don't have the time to go through it, but I just mentioned the, the, the sources. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, but he gives some, some clues um, um, about the, 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 the balance of the things. He calls something, oh, the, what he calls the fourfold, qua, quadratura, quadratura, the fourfold. 
which is not one thing, like the, like the Trinity. The Trinity is not one thing, and there are not three things. It's different. And the fourfold as well. So he said, we live on the earth, so we have to take care of the earth. Well, that everybody understands more or less. Hmm? But we live uh, under the sky, the cosmic aspect. For instance, who knows how to calculate the day of Easter? It's directly linked to this cosmos. One of the most important par uh, feasts, days in the Catholic Church. But we don't know how to calculate it. We don't even know why. Why it is changing every day, every, every year. It has to do with the moon. And with the sun. And the seasons. Easter is, just to answer your question, the question huh? everybody knows the 22nd of March and 22nd of September are special days because Exactly. Day and night are exactly the same. So Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the 22nd of March. That's why it's changing. But we don't know. We don't know it anymore. We're not in contact anymore. Huh? And there is the spiritual aspect. Everybody has this question. What I am doing here? You, you recognize that question? What I am doing on this earth? My hell. I wish my parents didn't create me. Huh? You have these days. You have these essential questions. Where do I come from? And that's a problem with modern architecture also sustainability. It doesn't give answers anymore. But it makes part of the essence, and therefore, from, of sustainability. <coughs> and then we live between what he calls the mort mortars. It has to do with our perception of time, that we can talk about and do exercise with that. Uh, but human mind is, in one second, I'm in, at the Big Bang. And the other second, I'm 10,000 years ahead. That's, we can do that as human beings. And at the same time, I'm 54, I know, 25 years from now, it's over, at least here. Hmm? But what gives meaning to my life is not 10,000 years from now, this is what I'm doing here right now. That's the mortal aspect. I don't know if it's here, but in, in Brasilia, the federal, the, the capital of Brazil, public servants, salaries skyrocket high, but the, uh, the group that most try to commit suicide are not the youngsters, are recent retired public servants. Always a lot of money, working, 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 and then <whistles> no meaning. Hmm? So, these are all aspects of sustainability, of essence. So, he says if these are in balance, then the quadrature comes in. And by the quadrature, by, by definition, is sustainable. Another one, Malo Ponti, he wrote a lot about it, about our perception of things. Hmm? We need to construct. Because human being does not survive on this earth, this planet, without protecting himself. So we need to build. We need to interfere. Nothing against it. The elephant interferes to man because he eats water, 300 kilos of 
of green leaves today, whatever it is, so it interferes. The question is how we interfere. Hmm? And that has to do with this perception, what he says. I already spoke about this, huh? that the, per the, the phenomenon is how I per perceive things. It is interesting, if I meet somebody, I already talked about this changing, but every time I meet this person, there is the possibility, there is an aspect that I don't know yet. I had a friend, a, a monk, he lived in Mallorca, Mallorca. Um, he had a stone, just a common stone. And for 50 years, he, for one hour a day, he looked and concentrated on the stone. And he said, this stone never has been the same. Because he always discovered something new of the stone, but by doing so, also something new about himself. So that's changed his perception. So you imagine, if we do that with ourselves, and with architecture, and with social processes, then we change, and then we change also the way we we design and we plan. So it is, it is not a rational, logical process. It is the experience that comes there. Yep. Okay. Um, before going into how we apply that, uh, now just let me just explain. So um, this is a scheme how we work in open space, the firm. Uh, this. The lower part, everybody knows. You make a project, and the first BIM modeling, and the second one, and the adaptive project, all technical stuff. What we are talking about until now is here. Because if I work with a client, and the perception of the clients change, and I change, then of course the input changed, and the results change. So, let me be very clear, phenomenological sustainability works on the demand side. Because a lot of clients, I, I'm sure that know what they want, but don't have consciousness about it. Yes, case study. Because I talked a lot, but the question of course, how to apply all this, uh, this stuff. Hmm? So, um, this is a private house of a young couple in Brasilia. This is the plot. Original uh, landscape of the Cerrado, which is a protected area or landscaping in, in Brasilia, in uh, the Midwest of Brasilia, Brazil. Uh -huh. And they came also. This is an image that they give me. This is what we like, exactly as I thought. Oh, good. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know, in whatever kind of 3D, 3D program he, from internet, he made this, this thing. Um, so then it's important for as an architect to separate the form and the essence of what they want. This is how he translated the essence in a form. But of course, you can translate essence in a, in a lot of forms. Hmm. Okay, so then we did what I do with the clients, and here are some pictures with them on the land, etc. Is a workshop with a with the private house. It is more or less one day and a half with exercises, like we just did here. And depending on the on the group, if you do it with a school, of course, I use other. We use other uh, methods and other exercises than with, uh, with the family of five people. And with the firm, it is different. It depends on the question of the, of the client. Uh, but these are some techniques that we use, or, or languages, let's say, that we use. Uh, but you can see all of them, I don't know if you know them, but uh, work with the right side of the brain. So these are methodologies 
to create and visualize what is present in the field, what is present in them, in their unconsciousness, what, what they would like, but are not able to express rationally in words. Because then the, the concepts come in again, the old concepts. And this is here, in the moment, what comes up. So here you see them exercising, working with the energy. One of the questions we ask in this typical case, it is not always, eh? but you can, because it was a very special landscape, um, if the land would design the house, how it would be? The earth has wisdom as well. Hmm? So that they painted that and then interpret, and of course we, is, we need the rational part as well to interpret that, the results and to tra translate them. But the, at the moment you do it, you don't think. So it has to do with the right question. Hmm. Be very specific in, a, in, in, in your question. Because the question is already, uh, gives direction to the answer. If I ask you a stupid question, the chance that I will get a stupid answer is rather big. If I ask you an intelligent question, probably I get an intelligent answer. Hmm? So you direct with the question, you direct the process. So. Hmm? Mm -hmm. yes. Well, and these are the first, just to show how it uh, became here. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the plan afterwards. This is the preliminary design, because uh, what what the, the, this couple did, they measured the position of all the trees on the land, and said we don't, we are not going to cut any tree. And they've got a couple of other things, eh, because a form is never the result of one reason. Rem Koolhaas, you know Rem Koolhaas, eh, the Dutch architect, he says for every decision in architecture you have to at least three reasons to justify your decision. And beauty is not a reason. <laughs> eh, so, so here you see it. Hmm. So what we did here, these are all the ecological bricks that don't go into the oven. So very low carbon pr uh, footprint. Mm -hmm. A lot of wood, negative carbon footprint, right? And you see what was, worked very well here is, is the connection with the garden. Yeah, we considered it as, as you can see it in the, in the, in the plan, space is continuous mm -hmm. and not as little cells. Hmm. And this is in, under the, in the, near the entrance. Um, in, in winter, to now in Brasilia, the uh, relative humidity drops until 10, 9%. Very, very dry. A lot of people with breathing problems. So we created this water, uh, how do you say that, uh, this water fountain. fountain, yeah, with these forms, these are flow forms that is filter the water, water has the quality to, to clean itself uh, if, if you write movement in the river, so that this imitates the movement, so there's no filter here, and that humidifies the, the air in the, in the winter. <laughs> Just one thing, um, this is just an example. Um, what we're talking about here is about the demand, how to, to get the essence of what a client wants, right? Of course, there also exists something like phenomenological design, how you translate it later into a form. That I'm not talking about. I just showed here. 
Yeah? Because then we come into other things because we talked about perception in a vertical way and in a horizontal, horizontal way, but it's also vertical perception. But it becomes more difficult and that will and we will still here, be here tomorrow when we start talking about that. Uh, but just to make clear where, what, what we're talking about here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, another process. Um, planning process, urban planning project. This is a social project. Um, is it? Which project is it? Yeah. Um, there we do workshops as well. But of course, uh, the themes are totally different than with a couple or for a private house. Eh? Job generation, uh, income generation, uh, gender questions, uh, no, everything comes up. But in, in other situations, don't come up. So the, the scheme is a little bit different. Yeah? And of course, uh, in planning, bigger scam planning schemes, in a house as well, but less, but uh, the financial part comes in. As I said, this is urban plan in, for low income housing in, in a city in the interior of the state of Rio in Brazil. Uh, what was, has been developed by the low income families. Um, um, before we started the urban design, we had a lot of. If you can continue, please, Gustavo. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, we we inverted the thing. First, we selected the, the people, and then we started the design process. So this this is the selection. Yes. Next one. And they were all interviewed at home to see, to check information to the family compos uh, composition, uh, income, no, uh, whatever, all these questions, yeah. And then we started workshops with them. In the same way as I explained, starting with their dreams. In subgroups, and here they are presenting things. Uh, about their house, my family, my community, and all the, these ideas were used to develop the urban plan with them and by them. And then, when the urban plan was developed, uh, we had 500 plots. How to distribute these plots? A lottery is not very democratic, huh? or we call it democratic, but it's a lottery. The whole group discussed, for instance, the, the sequence of choice. Who could choose first? So they established this criteria after workshops on this. So I forgot exactly, but first the elderly people, then uh, disabled people, and then people with a lot of, uh, uh, now one parent, families with a lot of children. And there we go. Hmm? So, and then, uh, um, so, and so the, the plots were distributed. And uh, what we saw is that when you invert this process and use, have the people define their own criteria, they feel responsible for their plot. If you gain it, at least in Brazil, I don't know how it's here. They will sell it or rent it out again or whatever <laughs> they do with it. Yeah? Because it's a means of income, but it's not something to create a, a life with your family. And then, now, we saw, uh, together with the housing bank of every family was uh, defined how much they could pay per month. And, so, and then we created cate c categories. And for every category were developed in the, on the, not the other side, yeah. other slide one, uh, models of houses, and also the way it could be amplified, according to the financial need, the family composition, and so the houses were distributed among the plots, and then we discussed. Uh, I'll give so, so just some examples, um, rules of living together. Yeah. There are a lot of women that 
made clothes at home. Well, that's an activity that doesn't interfere too much with your neighbor. But painting cars is already a thing which is not very nice for your neighbor. Yeah? So in the urban plan, we are also plots reserved for income generating activities, not for houses. So we defined this, all those rules, they defined them. And we just, we are a, a channel huh? yeah, here. Huh? Hmm? What? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here, this is houses. These are social uh, equipments, as you call. Here, this is generating income. Here's gener generating income. Uh, sewer systems. And well, this the line this was a very steep land, so that also influenced the the, lands, the, the urban plan, of course. Mm -hmm. But all these were done by them. Then another project. This is an upmarket uh, residential compound. Um, as we spoke about in the beginning, uh, normally things are planned in a traditional way, and if they're halfway, like in this case, then ah, it should be sustainable. Of course, too late. Everybody who knows a little bit about sustainability, this is not a sustainable plan. Uh, but okay, then we have to do something. But this is the first phase of a big pro bigger project. So what we decided, we, it was a, uh, we did it in cooperation with Useful Simple Project as a London-based uh, office that was responsible for the Olympic Games in London. They did the sustainability of the games there. So we decided to, to make a, a layover to see where we still could influence what was already there without interfering or stopping the process. We decided to work with individual plot owners to stimulate them to create sustainable houses. And one uh, social equipment we should build totally, totally sustainable as an example. Just to stimulate people and, and the owner to be in the second phase more sustainable. Third phase, etc. So it was not an objective. Okay, we're here and that, that's the end. We, we consider that also as a, as a process. To do so, yeah, we defined teams. One team that we discussed with Jorge, yeah? where is it? Place, place making. We just just uh, just to, to, uh, to the, tonight, yeah. But also, of course, climate change, transport, no, all, and this is just an idea. But we gave also uh, the interference with one thematic line with the other. For instance, uh, with uh, landscaping, you can influence very much the drainage system. You call it difference here, drainage is drainage. Yeah, yeah the drainage is, is the end, eh? but the, but the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you can reduce, with good landscaping, you can reduce dramatically the cost of, of drainage. But mostly they are just separated. You, they put the drainage in, and then the houses and the asphalt, and then, ah, Gore, we need landscaping. Landscape architect, nice, nice thing. In Brazil, they love Miami, so they make all kinds of Miamis there. A lot of water and irrigating, not sustainable. But if you integrate these things, then you can reduce a tremendous amount of costs. And then the whole thing is cheaper than a conventional thing. So that I say that, and I didn't mention that because that is one of the myths uh, that we discussed in the beginning, that sustainable architecture would be more expensive than conventional. But if you think in another way, it is more, it's cheaper. But you have to think in an integrated way. It's not the architect that makes a plan and then goes to the engineer and then to the for the, the calculation, structural calculation, and then goes to the engineer for the, uh, the installations and then goes to whatever. You have to work together as a team, otherwise it will not be sustainable. Even the lead, lead qualification, you know them, has discovered that, and the lead is one of the most 
well, retardada <laughs> things that exist in this world, they, they now uh, require that you show that you have to develop the project as, an, as a team. Without teamwork, no sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, other things we worked with were are not physical, this is the plan. Um, from a social point of view, sociological point of view, you can relate in your neighbor with more or less 20, 25 neighbors. If it is more, you don't know them anymore. That's, that's our human being, that's the limit for us. Huh? It's a nice rule of thumb. Yeah, it's more or less. Uh, it's cultural a little bit, but in general it is like that. So what we did on the plan, we divided the whole thing, the 500 of the, these were 600 houses, in, in subgroups of 25, more or less 25 houses. And why is that? If you can relate, you know your neighbor, your sense of safety increases. If you're anonymous, nobody will protect you. But if you know the people, you feel safer. You so, are safer too. And you are safer. So that means that we could reduce cost on security systems. So with non-material things, you can influence the material and the other way around, of course. Uh, so we, then we created these squares for every cluster of 25 houses, and then we connected them with special uh, landscaping and, and uh, uh, how you said it? running routes, and trimming routes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also those corridors. Corridors, yeah. And in, the, in these squares, um, this is not there, this, this is in, uh, in Germany, but we put in activities, and we use very much the children, to uh, strengthen the social context. I don't know if anybody of you has children already, but children are amazing uh, to communication. Your communication between the parents. Hey, that's your child, that's nice, where do you live, and that, et cetera. So we created things that are interesting for children. Hmm. And then people, as you can see, the parents will participate and, oh, where, where, where do you live? Oh, come have a drink, and uh, etc. And then things happen. Hmm. Of course, we don't, we don't know this is what, what comes out of it, but uh, no, this is some example of, of uh, energy yeah, that I will, well, everybody knows, yes. But the next one is interesting, I guess, transport. And who told it? It was Federico. To here, the, the, of, of the, the real estate uh, here, the real, huh? that they're now making cycle lanes also in the old city. Huh? <laughs> Separate cars, cycle, uh, bicycles, pedestrians, or whatever. Huh? And then you need, of course, signs to regulate all those kinds of things. And then, so why not this in a compound, also in the city? What happens, and then we studied, yes? Yes, please. We studied how the design influence speed. If you make separate lanes, you, people speed up. I drive in a car, this is my lane. The cycle lane is there, so get out of here. Cycling is the same. If you have a cycle lane and a pedestrian comes in, who gets mad? It's a cyclist. It's my lane. So you speed up, which is nice. If the objective is to <coughs> come from A to B in the most quick way, do it. But within a compound or in the center of the city where people don't use bikes, why cycle lanes? Huh? So what we did here is the entrance is we speeding up and the more closer you came to your house, 
the lower the speed was so that children can play in the street, people can meet in the street, etc., etc. So by the design you can influence the way people live together on the street. Yep. Oh, this everybody knows. Here you speed up and here. Of course, this is covered by a legal system. If there's no legal and educational approach for it, it is not only design, you have to, in a, to work in a total system, otherwise it won't function. But, huh? but there are cities in Germany, Denmark, in the Netherlands, that have only one traffic sign at the entrance. This city does not have traffic signs, neither uh, traffic lights. It's all like this. They return the responsibility to the user. And here, who is responsible, of course, is, are the authorities. So that's the responsibility. And that is cultural, of course. You cannot do all these things all over the world. It doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> but within a compound, you can experience with it. And another thing is the choice of material. You put asphalt, people speed up. It's nice. If you want to slow down, use, don't use asphalt, it doesn't work. Hmm? So the choice of material and the detail you make influences the way people use it. But what I'm trying to say is, first you have to define how you want that people use it, and then you design it, not the other way around. Last example, this is the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the workshop. The dreams, right? This family, you see, they have a paralyzed son in, in an accident. So guilt was a very, very present here. They have a po posada, posada, is the word? Hmm? Here, so the, the guests are very important. But here you see how we work. Everybody has their own dreams. They're different. And what I see very much, in a, especially in housing, but also uh, for firms, that people think that everybody should think the same. I don't know where the idea comes from. I'm different than you are, so I don't think the same. I don't have the same dream. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But when it comes down to building your house, everybody says, oh, no, we are the perfect uh, couple and we think the same. That's not true. But when people talking by the social pressure, they talk like that. But it's not true. So why not honor that this difference in the architecture? That's another way of sustainability, social, yeah, psychological sustainability. So we, we, we visualize this and then we see yeah, every, this is, well, every circle is a people, uh, one of the family. So with, which dreams are people have in common or not, don't have in common? Okay? The only dream in common is <laughs> with the guests. It's interesting. Yep. So here we designed it. This is in the northeast of Brazil, 40 degrees almost every day. Oh, just go back one, I guess I forgot. And at the end of the whole workshop, they gave, gave us three words for the house. Huge discussion. What's the meaning of a door? We can talk days about that, but they didn't want any door. Yep, also in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So it's an open structure. There's a lot of wind there, brisa. So what we did under the house, we have a big sustain, and the wind comes always from the drain direction, comes in, goes down over the water, and then into the house. And there's a huge chimney or whatever you call it, where the warm hot air goes out. Everybody knows the things on, on ships, on big ships, these round things. This is not for the air inlet, this is for the outlet. Yeah, that's why they're bigger here than the, the diameter there, because it, it pushes the air out. It's the same idea here, yeah? And then we did all the simulation with this system. You can simulate the temperature, the wind temperature, the water temperature, the, 
Of course, also the choice of the materials with constructive methods we use. Uh, we change that to create the cooling system. You see here, there's still a problem here, but in general, it is fine. Hmm? So we maybe some additional insulation here or another material. So then the, to optimize the final thing, mm -hmm. in order not to have uh, air conditioning, that, that, that's out of the question, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult with 40 degrees. Here you see the example of the outlet, the air. Mm -hmm. And this is from the inside. So this is double height, so the, the warm air goes up. So, and then, then I see at the end, you can see, this is the roof. And then we made also a lake. The, it's not very clear the picture, but here you see the glass. And here also, so the lake goes into the house. And the, the wind always comes in and goes out on top of here. So that's how we translated these things that they gave us. And from here you can see the whole house and all, all rooms, everything. That was it for today, I guess.